I'm Ian Somerville and I want to continue my series of videos on systems of systems by talking about architectural patterns for systems of systems. Now remember patterns are ways of organizing systems, there are things, there, there are organizations that we can observe in a number of different systems and it's fair to say that these are just emerging for systems of systems architectures. We don't really know enough about these. We haven't really studied them. So it's, a, it's early days for architectural patterns, but we can see a number of patterns emerging, which I'm going to talk about here. You can think of an architectural pattern as a, as a kind of stylized architecture. It's something, it's a, an abstraction, which we can see in a number of different systems. And I never really think of architectural patterns, either at a systems level or a systems of systems level, as a starting point in their own right for architectural design. Rather, they're a way of talking about an architecture, they're a vocabulary for discussing architectural issues and for stimulating the thoughts of the designers when building the design of the systems. In reality, Real systems are often hybrid architectures that have mixtures of patterns. The first pattern I want to talk about I've called systems as data feeds. And this occurs when we have a system of systems that takes data from a whole range of other systems. So we may have a, a principal system, such as a system that manages car licensing registration, and it takes data from systems such as a car insurance system. This diagram illustrates a situation where we have a central principal system taking data from four other systems. The data may be queried directly, that is, there may be simply a query interface between systems, or the data can be actually downloaded to the principal systems periodically. A characteristic of this architecture is the limited interaction. The interaction takes place between the principal system and the systems providing the data. The data providing systems generally do not interact directly with each other. Based on the system classification that I've discussed, we see this pattern emerging in organisational or federated systems, where there's a governance body that can control the interfaces and the evolution of the systems involved. A challenge, obviously, in dealing with distributed information is ensuring that the information about the same thing is recognised in all of these different systems. So this particular pattern is useful or is most useful when we have some generally agreed unique identifier. So if we're talking about uh, cars, it's their vehicle registration number, which is or which ought to be globally unique and therefore we can access any of the systems using that as a key. There's a, a variant or an evolution of this pattern where we don't have unique keys but we know the, the, the systems all have information about the same thing and in that context there needs to be an intermediate layer, something that translates the query into terms that can be understood by the system holding the data. This diagram shows the situation where data feed one is not provided by a single system, but by three separate systems. And there is a, an intermediate interactor that unifies the data from these systems. The next architectural pattern that I want to talk about is systems in a container. Systems in a container are where we have interacting systems to create a system of systems, but they're placed in an environment where there's a set of common services. And you can think of that environment as a container. We place the interacting systems into that container and they can access those common services. So that ensures we can provide, say, a single sign-on service, which allows access to all of the systems that have been placed in the container. And this diagram illustrates the situation where we have three common services 
accessible by all of the systems in the container. The container as a whole makes up the system of systems. We don't have a real container to do this. What we're doing is actually in implementing interfaces between the systems that are conceptually placed in the container and those common services. So we need to implement interfaces between the common services and the related services in the individual systems to ensure that they can interoperate within the container. And this limits the number of systems we can put into the container, unless of course these systems are developed with the container in mind. The iLearn case study, the digital learning environment that I introduced in chapter one, is an example of a system of systems implemented as a container. Essentially, we have a container providing a very small number of common services, such as a storage service and an authentication service. And within that, we place a range of other systems who can access and make use of these services. These systems can interact through shared storage or sometimes through other mechanisms. This diagram illustrates the situation for the iLearn system with the systems placed in the container and the common services that are offered. One of the problems with this approach to systems, systems in a container, is that the systems within the container can change at any time. So that a system may be placed in a container, but if its authentication interface changes, then the, the, it will stop working within that container. There's no control, there's no interaction between the developers of the system placed in the container and the owners of the system of systems implemented by the container. The final architectural pattern I want to talk about for systems of systems is a trading systems pattern. And this is a situation where we have a number of separate systems which trade information with each other. They exchange information, sometimes on an ad hoc basis, sometimes on a very organised and controlled basis. There's no single principal system, if you like, but what we have is a, is a, is a coalition of systems where processing can take place within any of the constituent systems. As the systems trade information, there may be one-to-one -one or one-to-many interactions between these systems. Usually, there's no general interface standard. Each of the system implements its own interface and implements its interface with the other systems in the container. That is, it's a completely ad hoc approach to system construction. We can use any systems we like and it's up to the owner of the systems to make sure that they interoperate with the other systems. Trading systems are essentially marketplace systems. They can be developed for any kind of marketplace, but are most appropriate where we have automated trading, where automated agents interact directly with each other rather than trading systems that involve people placing orders. And the area where we have seen this type of systems of systems is in algorithmic stock trading, where we have systems owned by trading companies which interact automatically with each other to trade stocks. Sometimes this is called high frequency or high speed trading. The big problem with this approach is there's virtually no governance whatsoever. Systems can change at any time, which means that some of the systems involved may simply stop working without notice. In summary then, we can see in existing systems of systems three patterns emerging, systems as data feeds, systems in a container, and systems as trading systems. And what we'll see as we gain more experience in creating new software systems by integrating other systems is new architectural patterns that will emerge over the next few years.